Hey everybody, this is Praxis. At the end of last year I made a prediction. Even though I don't make predictions very frequently on this channel, I made a very specific prediction that I felt we were getting to the end of the first act of COVID. At some point in this year of 2022, uh, the way that people have been dealing with COVID, at least here in the United States, was going to dramatically change. Well, I've been paying attention to the news and it looks like that change is happening even sooner than I had anticipated. And because of the way in which that's happening, there's something super, super important that you and I need to think about doing right now. Okay, so what is this concrete thing that you and I should definitely be thinking about doing right now? Before we get into the specifics of that, I want to talk about some of my thinking behind it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to just go on YouTube and listen to someone tell you to do something and then do it without understanding the reasoning for it. That's what we call being an idiot. So let's talk about some of the reasoning for this and you can decide what for yourself whether you think it also, uh, you know, if you agree with me that this is a really good idea. To begin, let's go back to the end of last year. At the end of last year, here on this channel, I made a prediction. Now, I don't usually make predictions here on this channel. I'll talk about things that might happen or could happen. You know, in the field of emergency preparedness, uh, you know, there are things that are possible and you kind of prepare for them whether you know that they're absolutely going to happen or not. But there is something coming up this year that we absolutely know is going to happen, or at least we presume it is going to happen and we hope that it's going to happen, and that's the midterm elections here in the United States. Because that is happening, it was my feeling that another thing was going to precede that. And that other thing was going to be a loosening of the restrictions and a, uh, a letting up on some of the more totalitarian kind of uh, responses to the COVID situation. Uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that I don't think that the Democrats have much of a chance of getting reelected, uh, you know, come the midterm elections. I think they're gonna have a hard time of it anyway, but especially if, uh, you know, they are still like balls to the wall on, COVID restrictions, people can't go out, and people getting like you know fired from their jobs and all this kind of stuff. If that stuff is going on, if they haven't declared victory, their chances of having any kind of success, I think, are incredibly nil. Even though I think they're they're probably pretty low to begin with anyway. Um, so because of that, combined with the fact that we were looking at the Omicron variant, uh, you know, I, I have even speculated on this channel, speculated, not uh, you know this isn't like prediction level, but speculated that Omicron is so much more mild and uh, so spready that it almost seems like it was genetically engineered specifically to act as a way of mitigating COVID. Uh, you know, it spreads to the population super easily. Uh, the symptoms generally are, you know, super mild. That, that said, I'm sure people have died from it. You know, that's just the way these things are. People die from colds and flus. Remember Jim Henson? He died of a like regular cold that turned into pneumonia. So, you know, people die from all sorts of things all the time. But, you know, comparing apples to apples, much more, uh, um, you know, much more mild. And uh, because of that, it really gives the people in power the opportunity to say, look, we did it. It was the vaccines we forced you to get or whatever. You know, who cares what they say is, you know, the, the rationale for it. But there is a real moment uh, at some point this year for, uh, you know, people in power to say, you know, we did it, you're elected the right people, you know, now we're giving you our freedoms back because here in the United States, we know that freedoms are gifted to us by government. They're not inalienable rights. Uh, they're not natural rights. They are gifted from government. Uh, you know, if, if you're familiar with the founding documents here in the United States, you know, I'm joking about that. I'm being sarcastic. Yes. Uh, but, uh, you know, People got their people got their their talking points and whatever you know they'll be like oh look you know the the government gave us our freedoms back we should reelect them that's gonna I think gonna be the hope now it was my thinking that that would happen kind of in the spring going uh, into the summer probably like you know late spring early summer you know somewhere somewhere on springtime is when I thought that we'd start seeing that happen but it seems like it's happening even sooner than that and because of some of the ways in which uh, that is being dealt with. That is what has kind of got some alarm bells going off in my, in my head in terms of kind of next things that we need to kind of be looking out for and some things that you and I might want to get ready to, you know, uh, take care of for ourselves. Um, specifically, the reason that it's happening early, it would seem, is that there is a new study that's come out. It's, it's on the CDC website. I'll try to put the link to it. Uh, YouTube seems like it likes killing links here on my channel because it's like, this is the misinformation channel. Right at the beginning, I was suggesting that uh, masks were something that people should be doing when the CDC was saying that it's not airborne, don't worry. I was saying, you know, I was pumping out that fear porn of misinformation saying people should actually mask. This is respiratory. You should be wearing masks for this. Notifications don't go out. I know links, hyperlinks that I put to websites, you know, even when they're like the CDC, they get like blocked. So if it's down there, you know, you know um, 
you can go to it, and if it's not, at the time of this recording, I don't know whether it's going to be blocked or not. Usually they get blocked. But I'll kind of give you the short version of it. If you look at the, the, uh, at the study, the, uh, the summary of the study is that people should definitely get vaccinated, and uh, even if you had prior exposure, you should make sure that you get a booster shot. Those are very effective. But if you look at the data in the study, and specifically, uh, there's a really wonderful chart at the bottom of the study, uh, the data couldn't be more opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> because what the data says is that yes, vaccines are pretty effective at bringing down your risk of hospitalization. Prior exposure, which gives you a, a degree of immunity, is even better than vaccines, even more uh, effective than vaccines. And, and if you take people who have had prior exposure and give them a booster shot after that, the difference is essentially nothing. Again, if you look at the like the actual summary where they like summarize it, which I think is as deep as reporters and journalists tend to go, uh, it says the exact opposite of that. But I, you know, it's only a matter of time before this data really starts getting out there, and uh, the smorgasbord of. Um, you know, money making off of vaccines, I think is kind of starting to come to an end early. Uh, you know, and I think because of that, you know, this the uh, the turnaround in terms of government's response to this is starting to uh, you know you know turn early because it's like you know they can only hold back the tide of reality uh, you know for so long. You know, the money to be made on this is starting to dwindle. So now it's you know you kind of concede reality at some point and you know you move on from there. Dr. Fauci, whom I do have a degree of respect for, I think that he is you know, maybe not managed COVID the best way that it possibly could have been managed, but, uh, you know, he's seeing things from a certain perspective. I don't think that his intents are uh, as nefarious as many people kind of attribute to him. I think that it's just sort of like if it, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I, I think it, it's that kind of situation, and, you know, uh, you know, it is what it is. But uh, recently he was speaking to the world, and uh, I think he understands that the hyper-focus on COVID is about to collapse, and, uh, you know, while... Uh, himself and other people like him have been in the spotlight for a while uh you know that spotlight is about to start diminishing the microphone is about to be taken out of their hands uh you know i think he's smart enough he recognized the writing on the wall and he's begun to pivot and this is the thing that this video is about to what are they pivoting uh, and uh, what are the ramifications of that to you or to me uh well the thing uh, to which he was pivoting was antibiotic resistant bacteria uh, you know, they're talking about how, you know, uh, the, the danger of COVID is starting to subside, you know, for whatever rationale you want to, you know, give to that, you know, whether you want to say it's all because we just kept pumping vaccines into people or it's because Omicron came out and it made everybody immune anyway, whatever kind of rationale you want to put behind it. The reality is that the danger of COVID is diminishing. And, uh, you know, while they still have the mic in their hand, again, I... I don't think that he's like this nefarious devil creature that is, you know, out to, you know, enslave us all. I think that he's trying to do his honest best with things. And antibiotic resistant bacteria is a real problem. And while he still has the microphone, he wants to try to start addressing that. That's good. That, that is good because, you know, antibiotics are a wonderful asset that we've had. They, they've turned, you know, bubonic plague, the Black Death, uh, you know, in Europe, which killed, what was that, like, I think two out of three people that got that ended up dying from it. 66% death rate as opposed to, like, 1% with COVID. You know, a real terrifying uh, pandemic uh, kind of disease. Um, you know, antibiotics have taken that and turned it into, like, you know, if you get it, you know, you just pop some antibiotics. Now, that said, there are actually some antibiotic resistant strains of uh, plague that are starting to circulate, and that's part of the problem. So it's a, a real thing that we need to be uh, thinking about because antibiotics have taken our world and just made it so, so much better. So it's something we should definitely be thinking about. Uh, but my concern is how are they going to address that? Are they going to be addressing that by, you know, looking at, you know, big agribusiness that pumps literally tons of these things into animals. They have animals living under these horrible, unsanitary, unsafe, unhealthy conditions, and they compensate for that by just pumping huge amounts of antibiotics into them just to keep them alive long enough to kill them. Uh, I don't think they're going to really address that because there's so much money there and um, <laughs> it would just make too much sense. Uh, are they going to address, uh, address it by, you know, addressing hospitals? Hospitals are a big breeding ground for these things. And I don't know that there's necessarily anything that hospitals are specifically doing wrong along these lines. It's just that, you know, when you create an environment that's that clean, it is a, um, you know, it's a competitive breeding ground for things that can get around that clean. Uh, you know, are they going to address that? I don't know. Well, how did they address COVID? Uh, you know, uh, COVID has oftentimes been described, I mean, incessantly been described as the pandemic of the unvaccinated. 
I'm unvaccinated, and I've never have co I've never had COVID. I've never passed COVID along to people. Uh, and I know there are a lot of other people who are unvaccinated who've never gotten it, never spread it around. I know that I. <laughs> I don't know personally, but I am sure that there are plenty of unvaccinated people who have gotten it and have spread it around in the same way that there are plenty of vaccinated people who have gotten it and have spread it around. I don't see the dividing line so much as being between vaccinated and unvaccinated as much as the government has tried to set that up to you know kind of pit us against each other. The dividing line that I see between it is that it is more of the pandemic of people who didn't want to, uh, people who didn't want to or were unable to change their normal daily practices. Here in my family, we substantially changed our daily practices and the results were very clearly uh, obvious to us that, you know, not only did we not get COVID, we didn't get in colds or flus or anything else. So we were able to change our daily practices and it had that result. Uh, you know, for people that just kind of went about their their lives as usual, like, you know, they got vaccinated, now it's like I'm clear to do whatever I want. Those people were kind of, you know, they were spreading it around. So, you know, there were plenty of people that were spreading it around that were vaccinated. There were plenty of people that were spreading it around that were unvaccinated. But the real difference was the people, you know, that were able to change uh, or willing to change their daily uh, you know, lifestyle practices. So for, from my perspective, it was more of a, a, a pandemic of people who were addicted uh, to, you know, living their lives the way that they normally live their lives. But that's not the way a lot of people saw it. That's certainly not the way the government painted it. The government painted it as the, uh, you know, the pandemic of the unvaccinated, the marginalized, you know, the small group. Um, and, you know, that obviously works for political reasons. I mean, we've seen that throughout history. You know, whenever the government can find some small group and kind of pin the blame of everything on them, and I am not going to make a Holocaust uh, comparison here because they are huge uh, orders of magnitude different between them. But the thinking is kind of the same, that you find a, you know, a small group and you kind of like uh, focus, uh, you know, the larger group, you know, the majorities, uh, you know, distrust and, uh, you know, anger towards them. Uh, you know, here in this country, even recently, you know, it's it's immigrants. You know, it's like, it, you know, if you don't like the way the economy is going, it's got nothing to do with the way the Fed has managed things. It's got nothing to do with the idea of, you know, offshoring all of our jobs somewhere else. What it, you know, who's really responsible for your dissatisfaction with the economy is the immigrants. You know, they're a small marginalized group. You know, so this happens all the time, uh, you know, under, you know, so many so sorts of different situations. Um, uh, and it happened during COVID. Will it be the same thing that happens during uh, a intensity of focus on antibiotic resistant bacteria strains? Uh, if we start focusing heavily on that type of thing, you know, where is the blame likely to go? I, I mentioned early, I, earlier, I don't think it's going to be agribusiness. I don't think it's going to be hospitals. I think it might be people that are like us preppers that, you know, use things like fish antibiotics <laughs> or, you know, uh, you know, get our own access to antibiotics for, you know, treating ourselves. Uh, you know, if you've watched my channel for a while, you probably know that I've done a couple of videos on, you know, specifically uh, aquarium antibiotics. Uh, I've used them on a number of occasions uh, very effectively. I, I understand and appreciate the risks of not using antibiotics uh, effectively. Uh, and I'm sure that there are a lot of people that buy their own fish antibiotics and don't use them effectively in the same way that there are a lot of people that get prescribed antibiotics from their doctor and they go to the pharmacy and they take them for a while and then they feel better and like, I feel better. I don't, there's no reason for me to keep, uh, you know, taking these antibiotics which is exactly the way that you, you breed antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria. So again, you know, I, I think that this is a big problem, but it's going to be dealt with in kind of a simplistic sort of way in the same way that COVID was. Um, again, that is if people uh, are able to, you know, get people really focused on this. So what does that mean for us? You know, if uh, people like us that, you know, you know, might be interested in, uh, you know, having a store of antibiotics for, you know, if there ever was an emergency situation and you can't get to the pharmacy or there are shortages. I mean, who could ever imagine there'd be shortages? Uh, certainly not me. I mean, that just seems like something out of science fiction. You know, there would never be any kind of shortages here in our, our culture. But, um, you know, for people like us that are concerned about that, and we, you know, might uh, acquire these things, are we going to be uh, the, uh, the scapegoat? of all of this and and what might happen because of that. Well, what I think might happen because of that is some of these um, access points that we have for getting antibiotics might start to dry up. I've gotten fish antibiotics in the past, bird antibiotics in the past. Again, I've used them. I've had uh, one case of cellulitis when I scraped up my leg and I 
The other was the one day I didn't bring my EDC pack with my bed bag in it, so I got cellulitis in my leg, and the uh, the antibiotic was like a miracle. You know, it's like if you have an issue where an antibiotic is needed, ain't nothing else going to do for that. I mean, you know, I, I guess there are some like holistic sort of food-based things you can do to like maybe better your chances, but you know. When you need an antibiotic, you need an antibiotic. So, you know, what are we going to do if they start uh, curtailing our ability to access these things? Well, what do preppers usually do? You get them now ahead of time. And that's what I've started to do. Uh, there are a couple different ways of doing that. Uh, there are different uh, fish antibiotic places. Uh, one that I've used in the uh, past is Valley Vet. Um, I don't know if I want to risk putting an actual link to that in the hyperlinks below. It'll probably get killed anyway. Um, there's that, but there's also another one, and this is what I wanted to mention to you guys in this video. Um, in terms of uh, prices, fish antibiotics, and they ain't no deal or anything like that. You know, you, you pay a hefty sum for fish antibiotics too. Um, so uh, there's another uh, outlet that I've um, become aware of lately I want to share it with you guys, and that is a, uh, it's telemedicine, and uh, it's a place specifically called Jace Medical. Uh, I, I heard about it first on Full Spectrum Survival. Brad over there had been interacting with them. Then recently I, I saw the Canadian Prepper had done a, a video on it. In fact, I found Canadian Prepper's video because I made an order with Jace Medical and I was wondering, you know, I wonder if Brad at Full Spectrum had had like a coupon code or anything like that. So I, I searched it on YouTube and found out that Canadian Prepper had just done a video on the same topic and I used his coupon code. And that's what I want to mention to you guys. Um, right now, I think it's only a couple of weeks that the coupon code is good for. Uh, you can get a pack, they call it like their... I don't know, their emergency preparedness or whatever, uh, you know, pack of different antibiotics. And there's a lot of ones that I've used in the past. It's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good mix of different things that I think would be very useful. It's 250 bucks, and uh, this coupon code that Canadian Prepper had put out there, it's just Canadian Prepper, uh, I'll, I'll do a link to his video, you can, you can confirm that, and I'll, as well as confirm uh, how long that code is good for, because it wasn't good for super long. Uh, it gives you 20 bucks off of the $250 purchase. 250 bucks is a lot, but again, like I said, if you have a situation where you need antibiotics, ain't nothing else going to do for that. So uh, it's a really great asset you can have in your pantry I would keep it in a cool dry place uh, um, because uh, if if kept properly a lot of antibiotics they list a, a, um, a shelf life of a couple of years but there have been many studies I've been working on compiling a, um, a kind of a booklet that would have a lot of this information. There have been many studies, you know, uh, financed by the United States government uh, who buys a lot of med uh, medicine and had been throwing a lot of it out when it kind of reaches shelf life. And they decided to uh, use soldiers as guinea pigs. Ain't nobody ever heard of that before. And, you know, through this study, they were able to determine that a lot of these antibiotics have... Um, uh, a lot of efficacy, uh, you know, well, 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 like decades past their expiration date. Some of them don't, so you got to be careful about it. You got to do your research on it. But uh, you know, if you are to store antibiotics, you keep them in a cool, dry place. They can last, you know, they can last for a while, depending on which ones you're talking about. So, this is what I'm talking about in this video. Is you might want to try to get those antibiotics sooner than later because those doors may close. I don't know that they're going to close. This is not a prediction like I made, you know, at the end of last year where, I, you know, I was suggesting that what's happening right now I felt was going to happen. It's not a prediction. It may not happen. You know, the, the public spotlight might move on to something else and everybody just forgets about antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, I think that that's fairly likely, as a matter of fact, because uh, people don't tend to want to deal with problems until they are absolutely unavoidable, that you can't possibly ignore them. I think people can probably ignore antibiotic resistant bacteria for you know, a while longer here. So I don't know that, uh, you know, this is immediately going to bite, but it's probably going to bite at some point. And just having antibiotics in your house for any kind of a situation, it's it's a good thing anyway. So even if the door is not just about to close, you know, why not get them anyway? You know, just think about being in that situation where you have a family member and they clearly have some kind of bacterial infection and, you know, to be absolutely powerless to help them in an emergency situation, that's going to be an awful feeling. And the peace of mind that you can create for yourself by having that, that prep of having some antibiotics in your pantry, I think that's worth 250 bucks, personally. Um, so, now that you have all the backstory around it, you can make a decision about whether you think that that is good advice or not. That's it. Thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com.
Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.